This episode of The Minimalists is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. <laughs> Hello to our fellow simpletons. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the head simpletons. You know what? I'm here with my future co-defendant, Ryan Nicodemus. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? I sent you a text like, hey, can you be a re- uh, just a heads up? I'm using you as a reference for like an apartment that Mariah and I are trying to get. Yeah. And you were like, at this point. I've already opted in to, to everything up to and including co-defendant. I, what, is co- what is a co-defendant? It means we're both charged for the murder, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Or for hoarding. Today we're talking about hoarding. And, you know, it's... It's fascinating. I did a whole bunch of research when we were writing Love People Use Things because there is a section in there. It's a much shorter section than uh, initially was, but in doing that, I read so much about hoarding. And so I wanted to start today by, you know, this is a heavy episode. Mm. Talking about hoarding is heavy because it's not just about clutter. It goes beyond clutter. Mm. So I thought we would start off with some fun, morbid humor from Diane Wade over at minimalist.org. Minimalist.org are our free local meetup groups. We have an online meetup group, and then we have 100 different cities in eight different countries over at minimalist.org. It is free to join. Uh, Let's see. So this is her Facebook comment. Occasionally, I'll just go in there, and I'll see what people are posting. Maybe they're posting about their progress or whatever. And she posted this meme, and it said, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul behind it. (laughs) And doesn't that put things in perspective? Yeah, it certainly does. We can't take it with us. Yeah, we can't. And by the way, the absurdity of trying to take it with you. Yeah. The U-Haul on the hearse is like, I I almost want that to be a book cover for us at some point with Mm. the... Uh, Remember we we drove a U-Haul on our first film, Minimalism, Mm -hmm. and... um, it was like a metaphor. I mean, it was real as well, talking about dealing with some of you know, the things in our lives. But it was really a metaphor of like driving around the middle of this beautiful desert, gorgeous, gorgeous area. And we just have this junk with right. us. Yeah. We're weighed down by junk. <laughs> Let's talk about the clinical <laughs> definition of hoarding. Yeah. I thought we would start with that. So hoarding, they also call it hoarding disorder. Someone who has a difficult time getting rid of things, regardless of actual value, Mm. may be a hoarder. Mm. Hoarding is sometimes considered a subtype of obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Interesting. However, and there's actually some speculation around that. Not everyone agrees on that. It makes sense to me, and and I'll explain why I think it makes sense. Yeah. Because the other side of the the spectrum, we're not going to talk about them today, but a Spartanist. Spartanist, yeah. Yeah, and so if someone who can't stop getting rid of things, in fact, they terminate their relationships, it, it ends in a very similar way to hoarding yeah. where it ruins their life. They can't mm. stop letting go, the meaning they can't hold on to anything, right? Yeah. Maybe we do a separate episode about Spartanist uh, and yeah. Spartanism because that mm. is a fascinating topic. Well, you know, anything taken to the extreme is going to be detrimental, right? Right, yeah. right. And so... Um, People often think of minimalism as an extreme, and it can be relative to the cultural imperative, but I would actually say our culture is the extreme version of Mm. nature. It it has gotten away from our nature. Yes. And so uh, back to the text here. However, hoarding refers to a disorder in which someone has difficulty getting rid of items regardless of actual value. The hoarding definition provided by the American Psychiatric Association further clarifies that hoarding is the persistent problem of getting rid of possessions uh, of getting rid of possessions that can lead to clutter and disrupt someone's ability to use their living or workspaces. Mm-hmm. So people who can't get rid of things, and it creates this clutter. Later on today, Ryan, I'm going to ask an important question. Are we all hoarders to some extent? Mm-hmm. But I think maybe instead of asking that during the lightning round, this article might might illuminate a little bit that yeah. maybe we are, and let's talk about the differences here. So uh, compulsive hoarding is different from collecting because the items are not necessarily displayed, nor do they necessarily have any value. Mm. Hoarding can lead to the excessive accumulation of items. Eventually, a person with hoarding disorder may not be able to move freely through their space. Wow. 
Until recently, hoarding disorder did not receive much attention. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5, previously listed hoarding disorder as a subtype or feature of other disorders, such as obsessive compulsive disorder. Interesting. But the most recent update to the DSM-5 placed hoarding disorder as its own category. Now, Ryan, I want to go through the common types of hoarding. These, this is not all-encompassing, but these are the most common types. Right. You might be a hoarder if... Right. In fact, do you want to read some of these yeah, common types to. of hoarding? This is great. So, um, yeah, when I was reading through this article... It was interesting be, uh, because some of these things I didn't even associate with hoarding, but now I do, and it makes sense. So the first one is animal hoarding. Animal hoarding most often begins with good intentions of rescuing animals from shelters or bringing in stray animals. Someone who hoards animals is likely to accumulate more animals than they can properly take care of. Mm. Instead of giving away some of their animals, they continue to acquire new animals. Two of the most common forms of animal hoarding are cat and dog hoarding, of course. Like, that makes uh, sense. I was like thinking giraffe hoarding would be in the top three, maybe. <laughs> like maybe, like, uh, parakeet would be top three. Giraffes. Um, Joe Exotic was an animal hoarder, right? He, oh, yeah, he was with tigers. That's absolutely true. Is that um, true, Jordan? Would you would you, can you diagnose him with a hoarding <laughs> disorder? <laughs> Doctor, Doctor No More. <laughs> um, can you hook me up with your giraffe dealer? <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would no. love to hoard giraffes. <laughs> um, however, a person can hoard any animal. Uh -huh. uh, this makes me think about the show hoarders, and yeah, a lot, a lot of them have. Uh, I think there's only one season on Netflix that Mariah and I watched, but uh, quite a few of them had dog hoarding. Uh, not really a cat problem, but yeah. I think about uh, we lived in Lebanon, Ohio. There was the cat lady. Mm -hmm. Literally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the chicken lady. And the chicken lady who had all the chickens. Uh-huh. Yeah. And oh, cats, man. strangely. Oh, yeah. She did have chickens and cats. And she had a few dogs. Did and she? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that so house is beautiful now. I can't believe how they were able to like yeah, they're restored. Uh, by the way, I, I didn't tell you this. So you know our text phone number. People could text us all the time, 937-202-4654. Yes. Someone texted me the other day uh, in the, the town that we grew up in, mm -hmm. uh, just south of Dayton, Ohio. He said, hey, I'm the city manager here, and uh, here's a picture of the home that's in your new documentary. It's being fixed up right now. That's incredible. Yeah, and it was like, I, I was pretty sure there were homeless squatters living in the house when we were filming it was, for less is now. It, it was torn apart. Yeah, it, it looked disgusting. It looked pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, even with you know, how uh you know, how poor you and your mom were, um, she was she kept a pretty tidy house. Like she was it, extremely tidy and, and yeah. aesthetically pleased. She was a maximalist. Yeah. And we, we just did an episode on maximalism over on uh, Patreon. Yeah. We did a whole maximalism episode. You can go check it out. Uh, Patreon.com slash the minimalist. It's yeah. over an hour long. And we, we talked about intentional maximalists and how one might actually benefit from that lifestyle. When could it be better than minimalism yeah. in some respects? She still had a lot of stuff. Yes. But it was still very tidy. Like I never yeah. felt like your house was like extremely messy. No, never. She she yeah. was tidy, especially when she was sober. Yeah. All, All right. right. Let, let's move on to. Well, uh, by the way, this is this article here is from the Recovery Village, mm -hmm. and so we'll put a link to both articles so, we're mentioning today in the show notes. So the next type is bibliomania. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know why, but I think of WrestleMania when I when I hear that just bibliomania. means book crazy, basically. Yeah. 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 So people who engage, I don't know if you want to read every single one of these in, in detail, but yeah, it's, it's when you hoard books. It's book hoarding. Yeah. yeah which it's book hoarding. We yeah. hear from these people all the time, by the way. Right. And by the way, I used to be, I was never an animal hoarder, but I was a book hoarder. I had about 2000 books at one point mm -hmm. and some of my father's books or old books, my mom's books, books, magazines too. man. Yeah. 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 I count the magazines as part of that collection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And here's the weird thing. Like we, we say collection. And they say even hoarding is different from collecting. I think sometimes we collect, we say we're collecting when we're actually hoarding. Yes. They say the things have no value, but you know, uh, everything has value to you if you're holding on to it. Otherwise, mm. you wouldn't be holding on to it anymore. But it doesn't mean it has value in the real world, meaning someone in the marketplace is willing to part with their money to take that off of your hands. Right. What yeah. other kinds of hoarding do we have? So we got shopper hoarding. Okay. Uh, so, so what does that you know, mean? It occurs when, so it shopper or shopping hoarding occurs when someone keeps every item that they've purchased, even if they don't use it. So, you know, I had this problem with my cell phones mm -hmm. where even though we worked at a telecommunications company, we still had to pay for our phones a lot of the time. Right. And they're expensive, man. Right. And uh, often like, I don't know, man. People don't understand 
that a phone company they don't just purchase a, a BlackBerry or an iPhone for twenty bucks. I mean, they it's there's a lot of money that goes into it. So even as someone who worked there, we had to spend a lot of money when we got a phone. So I held on to all my phones because there was this perceived value. Mm-hmm. Of well, man, I spent you know three hundred dollars on that phone. Right. I don't want to throw away three hundred dollars. But the truth is, as soon as you spend three hundred dollars on a phone, you've lost that three hundred dollars, and you're probably not going to get it back. Yeah, you're lucky to get fifty sometimes. Yeah, especially with like the Blackberries that we were that I was hoarding. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and so, and the holder, the longer you hold on to it, the less you're going to get out of it. <laughs> right. And so, shopping hoarding mm-hmm. doesn't take into consideration the sunk cost fallacy, mm-hmm. which you write about. Uh, extensively in Love People Use Things, uh, which will be out in July, by the way. LovePeopleUseThings.net if you want to pre-order it. That helps us out a lot. But the the, fa- the sunk cost fallacy, but also when we think of hoarding, the shopping hoarding is, is traditionally what we're thinking of, right? It, yeah. when we're not thinking of extreme hoarding with the pets. So it's the shopping hoarding. And I would even say the bibliomania is a type of shopping hoarding. Sure. I, I, I don't know that I would delineate it that much. They're, they're material possessions, just like the clothes in your closet, the excess electronics in your drawer or all of the the junk in your junk drawer that you're holding on to just in case yeah. in fact if i were to rename this category i would just call it just in case hoarding mm, yeah right. by the way all those books so, i was holding on to i was holding on to them uh, i'll read those just in, i'll hold on to them just in case i'm going to read them in the future they were aspirational yeah. but that aspirational purchase i thought it also made me it was ego driven. It made me look smart to have two thousand books, mm. some of which I'd actually read, most of which I hadn't even cracked the cover. Yeah. So uh, let me just read the last two sentences here of this shopper hoarding definition. The objects shopper hoarders may have can be anything: food, clothing, photos, televisions, collectibles, etc. These purchases typically remain unopened, still in their packages, with price tags attached. And this makes me think about, there was a friend of the family, I'm not going to use names, but her and her husband uh, were very affluent. Mm -hmm. They had amazing jobs. They had a huge house. Uh, They had a pool that we would always go and visit. Um, But when you went inside, it was was a lot of purchases that were unopened and still had uh, price tags on them. My mom, when she died, um, I was going through her closet and there were several things, you know, the famously talk about the 14 coats and winter coats in her St. Petersburg, Florida closet, yeah. right? Uh, one of them was a fur coat. And, and so, but the fur coat had a price tag on it. It was for like the goodwill, but still like she mm, was yeah. dying of cancer and still, you know, we're trying to purchase certainty, right? Yeah. Kapil Gupta says everyone defaults to their default, mm. <laughs> and, which is a tautology, but it, there's, a, there's a profound truth in that as well. Meaning sure. like, you you become who you already are in a way you know, who you are at your fundament you, you are what you desire is sometimes what we say yeah but I, if i were to append that at all i would say you are what your deepest desire is yeah. and now your deepest desires can change as you uncover what the truth of a scenario is and i think sometimes people hoard at least in my case i was a hoarder I, and i have ocd there's no question about this. Mm. And so I'm, I'm speaking to you not from a place of judgment, but speaking to you from a place of, of understanding. Yeah. A- and, and so I had a deep desire for pleasure, mm. but I didn't really. My deep desire at the time was to run away from pain, mm. was, was to hide from misery. And so I did that. And I quite literally, but also figuratively, covered up my misery with stuff. And, yeah. and the, the, the stuff hoarding, buying things that sometimes wouldn't come out of the box. Or if they did, I would set it aside in a closet somewhere, yeah. out of sight, out of mind. And, of course, the misery didn't go away. It amplified because I was now going into debt or I was spending money I didn't have to buy things I, I didn't want. I didn't actually desire those things. I desired a st- an end to the misery, but I was never going to get that from hoarding. What were you telling me the other day about we are constantly, we're not running towards pleasure. We're running away from pain. Yeah. Is that what you were? Yeah. Did I, I say that right? I, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think the same thing is, is, is true with this. This yes. isn't, this isn't, you don't ever see a pleasurable, ho- a, a, a elated hoarder, right? Mm, yeah. That's a good point. It, it, and when I was hoarding, now I have an organized hoarder, right? Mm-hmm. And so I had an ordinal system of boxes and bins and, and, 
and a huge walk-in uh, basement, you know, full-size basement full of stuff. Yeah. And, and it wasn't because I was, it was bringing me joy or contentment or even pleasure, really. Mm. In the moment, it might bring me a little bit of twinge of pleasure, but the hedonic ad- adaptation takes that away almost immediately. 100%. And so, yes, I was simply running from the misery. Yeah. I, 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 and I just wanted to stop the misery for a moment. And I figured that that tag Hewer watch for $3,000 would do that for mm. me. And it didn't. It just brought a bill in every single month, which made me more miserable. Yeah. So the next, uh, the next type of hoarding is food hoarding. Mm. So this kind of hoarding is particularly wasteful. Food hoarding is when someone brings home bags of groceries or excessive amounts of food when their refrigerator and cupboards are already full. The food may rot, attract rodents and bugs, and breed viruses or germs. In addition to buying excessive amounts of food, people with food hoarding disorders usually don't throw away the food either. It's not uncommon for food hoarders to have rotted food in piles around their ha- their house. This makes me think of the show Hoarders, and uh, quite a few of them were food hoarders. And this one man was like going, you know, the the therapist or like the, the organizer, whoever's there to help them go through it. She's like there and she's like, well, tell me about this food. And he's like, I can't get rid of that food. I mean, mm. look how many families that would feed. Mm-hmm. And she's like, this is, these are expired things. Mm-hmm. Like you might be poisoning a family. If you found a family to give this to that was in dire need, mm-hmm. they probably would eat it. But there's a chance of like them being poisoned from this food. Right. And he's like, well, I just don't see it that way. Yeah, you you don't. And right. but that's that's when when I talk about belief clouds the truth. Yeah. That's exactly what I mean by that. And so mm. someone who is hoarding food. By the way, I would argue that most of us are food hoarders. Sure. Go to your closets and cab- or cabinets and fridge right now. I I challenge you. You might come to my house and not find it, but even sometimes you'll find something that's expired in my house. Right. That's food hoarding. Well, yeah. And, and and because it's not being deliberate about the things that we hold on to, right? Yeah. And so I have to be really careful about that because I used to have just, I mean, you would have things that are three or four years out of date, you know, and but I'll hold on to it just in case. Now, why why do you do that? Sometimes it's because you don't want to deal with it. Mm. You're unwilling to deal with it. Yeah. But it has really nothing to do with a willingness. It has to do with an, uh, an understanding. And what the man that you're referencing didn't understand is that, this was already uh, has gone beyond a point where it could be useful at all. Yeah. And by holding on to it, it's just continuing the misery and making it worse. Yeah. So then the next type is trash hoarding. Yeah. Um, people with trash hoarding disorders not only save or keep piles of garbage, they often go through other people's trash to yes. find their own treasures mm. that they'll bring back to their house. And again, this causes a rodent pest problem. Because of the rotting trash, and uh, yeah, it's there's a lot of there's just danger with disease and germs and things like that. Not just because of the rotting trash, but all of the uh, all the critters that it that it kind of attracts. Yeah, and so we're calling this a you're saying the problem with the disease. The thing is that hoarding is a, a type of disease, and that's mm-hmm. why I say it's not it's not about simply decluttering. Mm-hmm. How tos aren't going to help you here. Yeah, because you could tell a hoarder how to declutter their home. That doesn't that doesn't give them any sort of leverage. Right. And also, just telling them to take action isn't going to do it either, right? What what the only thing that helps is a deep understanding of the problem. And yeah. and the problem here, well, what is the problem? It's fear of. Uh, not being enough. I mean, yeah. I think ultimately, and that, unfortunately, that's not in the definition. If I were to pin the definition, mm. I, I would simply say that we hoard because we fear that we are not enough. Yeah. We become self-conscious. Self-consciousness, by the way, the only time that we're not self-conscious is when we are not ourselves. Meaning like when, you, when you're in a flow state, when you're snowboarding, Ryan, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. there's a moment where you're never thinking about self. Right. Things are just happening. Yeah. There's no self-consciousness going on. Right. Uh, and, and so uh, hoarding is, a, is an extreme type of self-consciousness. It's the ego telling me that I'm incomplete. Mm. And therefore, these things, whether it's trash or dogs or dead cats in the freezer, as is the joke in Less Is Now, right? Mm-hmm. You know, my mom had a lot of stuff, but I didn't find any dead cats in her freezer. Yeah. But she owned 65 years worth of accumulations. And I think many of us 
we hold on to things not thinking that we're hoarding. And in a moment, we're going to get into the five levels of hoarding. And then we can all identify what level we are. Yeah. Yeah. So we got one more uh, type here, paper hoarding. Mm. People living with a paper hoarding disorder keeps all types of paper, like bills, invoices, books, magazines, coupons, junk mail, photos, report cards, receipts, recipes, etc. This is so common. Yeah. Hoarding paper can be a fire hazard. And if a pile becomes large enough and dangerous, uh, a dangerous hazard that could fall on someone. So this, there's stories of people dying because of like their stacks of newspaper mm-hmm. falling on them yeah, and suffocating them or... Better Call Saul season three, yeah. season finale. Yeah, right. Spoiler alert. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that was another disorder that he had, but mm-hmm. it... Uh, the, the funny thing about these disorders is a lot of disorders like this aren't real in the sense that they're not tangible the same way cancer is you can f- you can see the cancer in someone's body right mm-hmm. but that doesn't make this any less of a a disease right and it's not me diagnosing anyone here but it's simply saying when we say disorder break the word down not order disorder mm. chaos Hoarding is the physical manifestation of the internal chaos we all experience. And that's why I say, are we all hoarders to some extent? Well, yeah, we all experience chaos to some extent. And sometimes, oftentimes, especially in our culture, it manifests through physical stuff. Ryan, I'd like to go into some of the symptoms of hoarding. You want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, we can do that. Um, So hoarding symptoms include the inability to discard possessions and experiencing significant anxiety at the thought or attempt to discard items. A person with hoarding disorder likely has difficulty keeping their possessions organized and may feel embarrassment over the disorder of their living spaces. You know, so many people are embarrassed. When we go Mm. out and tour, when we're allowed to do that, um, we'd go out and we'd stay at people's houses quite often, you know, especially early on. We didn't have much money. We couldn't afford a hotel room. And so people like lend us their guest bedroom where they have these big houses or whatever. And the first thing, as soon as we get, we'll get to the door. What do they tell us, Ryan? Don't judge. Yeah. Don't judge us. No, I'm not a minimalist like you guys. Right. And, and that's what you're talking about here. One of the symptoms is embarrassment. So embarrassment is a strong word, but, but you can, what are some synonyms for embarrassment? Maybe just doubt, yeah. insecurity, yeah, self-conscious. fear, self-consciousness. If you're feeling these things, that is a, a low-grade symptom. Mm. Of, you know when they like, you, now that you go into a medical facility they, they, or anywhere, and they take your temperature before you can walk in? Yeah. And they won't let you in even if you have a low-grade fever, right? Right. A- and so you have the, the low-grade fever equivalent of hoarding <laughs> when, when some of these these lesser forms of embarrassment start peeking their head into the picture here. What are mm. some of the causes of, of hoarding? So, uh, I love your <laughs> little note here. While the causes, I'm sorry, while what causes hoarding is not known, it appears to have a genetic component. And then you have... It is known. Yeah, you have the note here of like, no, it's society. It is absolutely society. Yeah. Here's why. Um I was going to do this on the lightning round as well, but I thought this, maybe this is a perfect time to just in, inject this. This is from our, our new book, Love People Use Things. Mm. Uh, there's a section in here, Ryan, called Money is Not the Root of Evil. So we're going to replace money with stuff because it's just a different resource, sure. right? Yeah. And so I think you can replace money with any other resource here. I'm just going to read this real quick, but we can talk about why society is the cause mm. of hoarding. Yeah. Money seems to be the biggest point of contention in most relationships. We bicker, argue, and fight over household spending. And illogically, it seems to grow even more contentious as we get more of it. I read an observational study a few years ago about the differences between our closest primate ancestors, bonobos and chimpanzees. While neither animal uses currency, they behave very differently when it comes to one of their most precious resources, food. Mm. Like human babies, the youngest bonobos and chimps are both eager to share their bananas with others. No. But their proclivities bifurcate as they grow older. Mm. Bonobos remain generous and they continue to share their bananas with the rest of their family and friends well into adulthood. Chimps, on the other hand, hoard their bananas and will even use violence to fight off 
others who attempt to take one for themselves. What's even more fascinating is that even when bonobos are persuaded by humans to hoard, they continue to be generous. Researchers gave bonobos the opportunity to keep a pile of bananas for themselves while a fellow bonobo watched from behind a gate. Mm. But the altruistic bonobos always chose to open the gate and share their excess with friends. According to the researchers, chimps would never do this. They'd rather bicker and argue and even fight if necessary. Does that sound familiar? Mm. We adult humans tend to act more like chimps when it comes to our finances. Money destroys marriages, ends friendships, and breaks up business partnerships. This is why money gets a bad rap, but it doesn't have to be the boogeyman. Unlike our primate ancestors, we can choose how we behave with our resources. Instead of clinging to everything, we can channel our inner bonobo. Money isn't bad or evil, just like stuff isn't bad or evil. Yeah. It is merely an amplifier. Money won't necessarily improve your life, but it will amplify your existing behaviors. If you have quote unquote bad habits, then more money will make your life considerably worse. Mm. Think of all the lottery winners who end up worse off than they, than they were before they won. And if you're already a generous person, then more money can help you be more loving, caring, and considerate. Regardless of your past behavior, the choice is yours today. Are you going to be a chimpanzee or a bonobo? Choose carefully. Yeah. Your relationships depend on it. That's great. I think that with the hoarding thing and how this relates is, are you a chimpanzee or a bonobo? Mm. And I know for me, for at least from age 14, so puberty, 13, puberty mm -hmm. to uh, about age 29 or 30, mm -hmm. I was a chimpanzee and I would fight you for my stuff, yeah. right? And now I would just be inconvenienced if, uh, if like my house burned down. Like I, I prefer that didn't happen, Yeah. but I wouldn't feel the attachment to those things and the yeah. need to accumulate those things. Uh, I'd replace them only because it would make sense to replace my couch or my coffee table or whatever. Yeah. I wouldn't feel um, the pang of sadness for losing the thing itself. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk, Ryan, let's hmm. talk about um, the uh, how hoarding is diagnosed. Okay. So many people with hoarding disorder seek treatment for a co-occurring disorder or complication of hoarding disorders. Once the clinical, I'm sorry, once the clinician discovers the excessive hoarding of items, they can explore the reasons for hoarding and difficulties of parting with possessions. So I'm trying to understand this. The basically someone is a hoarder, but they're, so they're seeking treatment for a co-occurring disorder that that maybe hoarding hoarding is a symptom of something else that's going on is that what that's saying yeah so you know when uh a lot of people who die from the virus that's going around yes um they often say there are comorbidities mm. meaning um you know i i had that virus and i didn't have a comorbidity so i my chances of surviving it were much better than if i were to have you know diabetes or something like that right uh, lung uh, respiratory problems, uh, immunodeficiencies, you know, wh yeah. whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true with, with mental disorders. Often mental disorders are coupled, right? And so my father was schizophrenic, but he was also bipolar. Mm -hmm. And so these disorders are often... Um, Co-occurring. Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. I see. And, and, and one often fuels the other in, in a roundabout way. Yeah. Hmm. Let's talk a bit about uh, uh, the end of this. Before we get into the five levels of hoarding, yes. there are some hoarding statistics in here. Let me actually grab this real quick. So uh, this is one that stood out to me because I disagree with this, with the this statistic. Okay. Right. And, and really the reason I disagree is because it's how, how we just define things. Okay. Researchers have concluded that hoarding is more common in older adults, though it may begin to develop in adolescence. Yeah, I mean, I, not really. I mean, I see little kids where they have little collections of things, mm -hmm. but they never, I, I've never seen a kid uh, who, who doesn't, who isn't willing to share, who isn't willing to, the, the, the kids are like bonobos in many ways. They yeah. are, they are, they are self-absorbed. There's no question about that because they don't mm. have a prefrontal cortex. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, I'm just, it's, I'm so torn because yes, I do see 
what you're saying with kids and sharing, but then also there is this mine, 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 mine. Mm -hmm. There is this mine attitude that uh, kids will have. Like, I remember, I don't know, like my little cousins, they were, one would play with something Mm -hmm. and then the other one would like kick and scream until they got that thing Mm -hmm. and then they had it. Mm-hmm. And then the other cousin who was very laid back was like, okay, I'll play with something else. Yes. Then they would see them playing with something. They would kick and scream right. <laughs> until they could play with whatever, uh, you know, whatever the, their sibling was playing with. Uh-huh. Um, different, w- different, different yeah. thing, but same actual same underlying problem. Mm. The problem there is scarcity or the yes. idea of scarcity. Yeah. The scarcity mindset as opposed to the abundance mindset. Mm-hmm. There's no hoarder that has an, they have an abundance of stuff, but they don't have any abundance in their life. Well, you could tweet that podcast, mm-hmm. Sean. Hoarders do not have an, ab- hoarders have an abundance of stuff, but not an abundant life. Right. Uh, because the stuff has become their life. Right. I'm not against obsession. I think obsession is one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Yeah, it could be very healthy. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so uh, I have an obsession with writing. It gets me up quite often at 3 or 3.30 a.m. to write and I feel compelled to do it regardless mm-hmm. of what the outcome is. So obsession can be, as you said, healthy. There can also be unhealthy obsessions, but I think those unhealthy obsessions always have to do with scarcity and fear. Yeah. And there's also a greed component in there, but even greed I think has something to do with fear. Mm, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And so here's the stat. Hoarding statistics indicate a prevalence of almost 4% of the general population. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's the opposite. I think it's probably about ninety six percent. Yeah, and and w- you're going to see that because we're going to go right now into the five levels of hoarding and yeah, guidelines was, for recognizing the disorder. This was interesting. Now, yeah. this is also from the Recovery Village. Link to this in the show notes. Yeah. So we've already defined hoarding, Ryan. So. Um, what they're saying here, though, is depending on how extreme a person's hoarding is, the behavior can impact their physical or emotional health, relationships, financial and legal stability, and professional aspirations. Mm-hmm. Here's what I'll say, Ryan. My version of hoarding, while it didn't fit into, it wasn't stage five hoarding, mm-hmm. it certainly negatively affected my physical and emotional health, certainly my emotional health, mm-hmm. my relationships, my finances my stability mm. and my professional aspirations yeah and, and why because i would say creative aspirations it actually kept me from being the creative person i wanted to be because i needed to be corporate jfm in order to justify the uh or in order to to, to supply the lifestyle i had created for myself yeah there's more than one type of hoarding disorder there are several different levels of hoarding that identify the severity of a person's disorder the National Study Group on Compulsive Disorganization. What a group. The <laughs> National Study Group on Compulsive Disorganization <laughs> created a clutter hoarding scale with five levels of hoarding. There's a nice chart that we're going to go through here. You can find that in, the sh- in this article in the show notes. Mm. Understanding each level of hoarding can help people understand how to help those affected by the condition. Ryan, let's go through these levels. Level yeah. one... There are two things here. And by the way, um, we're going to go through levels one through five. And if you're looking at this here on the video, you can kind of see this chart. Actually, Ryan, hold yours up. Yeah, it's really well done, actually. It's very simple to follow. Um, Yeah, we'll get into it. It's really interesting. So what is a level one hoarder, Ryan? So you have uh, two of these... Uh, two of these symptoms checked. So uh, you have light amounts of clutter and no noticeable odors. <laughs> what a way to describe it. Yeah. Now, Ryan has some noticeable odors sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so does that make him level two? Yeah, you know. But um, here's the weird thing. I think what can happen is you can be level one yeah. and maybe not have, or you can be level two, for example, and not have all the criteria, but you can have some of these. In mm-hmm. fact, but you could also have maybe a criteria from level five. Sure. For whatever reason. And we'll go through some of these. Yeah, that's a good point. So so the second thing checked is all doors and stairways are accessible. So you have light amount of clutter, no noticeable odors, uh, and then all the doors and stairways are accessible. So yeah, that's interesting how it has all, because my doors and stairways are accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, I have uh, a junk drawer. Mm-hmm. This is a little bit n- not, uh, yeah, I mean- and no noticeable odors, so I guess I'm a level one hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would actually say we were both level one hoarders, a- and there may have been times where we were actually level 
two hoarders oh, to yeah. some extent. Um, we, we were both level one hoarders, maybe one and a half. Yeah. So what is a level two hoarder? What, what do they add besides those two symptoms that you already described there? This is disturbing, man. Uh, yes. Pet waste on the floor. Yeah. Evidence of household rodents. So this is the level two. We're not even to level five. Like this to me is already kind of extreme. Yes. Um, overflowing garbage cans, uh-huh. dirty food preparation surfaces. So I would say you had that. You had dirty food preparation services sometimes just because you're the sure. Ryan uh, is the messier half of the minimalist. Sure. We often say. Sure. But and, uh, yeah, but I was, I don't, yeah, I don't know, man. I kind of disagree. Like if anything, I would have, I would clean all my counters and then I'd put the dishes in the sink and then they might sit there for a day or two. Right. Yeah. And, and so to me, uh, when I see that as sitting there for a day or two, it's, it's just a piece of that. So it's like you were level 1.1 1. 1 or sure. something. Right. Yeah. Um, well, now let's talk level three. You oh add three god. more symptoms into that. Oh my god! At least one unusable bathroom or bedroom. So you have so much stuff in there. Here's something weird, Ryan. I actually had an unusable bedroom at one point. Really? Yeah. So. Oh, and you, are you talking about uh, when you were married? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so the first time I was married, I we lived in the suburbs in this big house. We had a we had three bedrooms. One was my office. We had this third bedroom that was basically a storage unit. And yeah. so when I say it was unusable, it was still neatly organized. Yeah, where your closet was, where you had all your shirts and suits and everything. That's the room you're talking about? No, that was my office. Then there was the other room that you never went because the door was always shut. Oh. It was upstairs. And yeah. it was it was tidy, so there weren't rodents and, and poop and trash. Yeah, but, but it, you didn't use it as a bedroom. Well, yeah, that's the thing. And by the way, it was unusable. You couldn't use it as anything mm. other than storage. Mm. And so, yes, I would say that in a weird way, that makes me, I, I had, I was level one, but I had a component of level three. <laughs> you were 1.3. There you go. Overflowing garbage cans. Yeah, I, I didn't have that, but I, there, there were times where you had that occasionally, but it was multiple. The, the, it says cans. Oh, wow. I mean, I think everyone plays that not everyone, but I think a lot of households play that game where they're like, mm. well, I can still put a piece of trash on top of there. Yeah. So I'm not going to, I mean, that's, uh, I've, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so for me, the overflowing thing is a metaphor in a way as well, right? Because sure. our lives are overflowing. With trash. Yeah. Trash cans. <laughs> Ryan, did you have a trash can or a trash can't? <laughs> <laughs> What's level four? Wait, did we? No, we didn't. There's one more. Oh, Odors yeah. throughout the house. Well, Ryan's always smelled like cool water cologne. <laughs> Dude, I used to love cool water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I forgot all about cool water. He's, that was like my favorite cologne for a while. Jordan, so, you don't wear cologne, do you? You're the only sub, let's see, you're only a sub 30 person. I know. I, I know as soon as I turned, I think, 31 and we moved to Montana. <laughs> I was like, yeah. what am I? We moved to Colin Wright, who is not a hippie-ish or spiritual or whatever. But he was like, yeah, I don't wear deodorant. And I'm like, wait, you can not wear deodorant and still not smell? He's like, yeah, it's you just shower. Yeah. And, and ever since, I, I mean, it's been what almost a decade, and I haven't worn, I haven't worn deodorant. Yeah. Uh, likewise, it's well, you know, it's it, there's a for anyone listening to this who's like, these guys are crazy. How can they not wear deodorant? There is a there's a period transition period there's a transition period where it gets your sweat kind of gets really bad and like you will stink a little bit more and you're and you're like no i need to go back to deodorant if you can get through the transition period Mm -hmm. then you your body will eventually equalize at least with josh and i it did the key is that if you start to get sweaty like you go to the sink and you got a little rag and like you wash your pits like i would wash my pits two or three times a day during that transition period and now I only have to wash them one or, once or twice a day. No. See, Bex <laughs> loves the way that I, I smell. I'm sure Mariah is the same with you. So there's the whole pheromones thing as well. And, and so wearing deodorant, wearing cologne, mm. and some uh, medical professionals even say that um, oral birth control will really mess up the mm. pheromones that we emit. Yeah. Um, and so, Ryan, I need you to stop taking your oral birth control. Never. Um, he's just popping pills during the, the podcast break. <laughs> no, um, I'm not saying to, to stop doing that, obviously. I'm just saying that when when we cover up our pheromones, one of the accidental side effects is we actually cover up the odor that attracts the the people that you know, love us the most. I yeah. love the way Beck smells. If she gets real sweaty and you know, gets off, you know, goes out for a run and comes back, you know, there's something about her pheromones that, that attract me. Cool. And so when we say odors throughout the house, that's not what they're talking about. They're, they're talking about there's the a, odors of filth. The odors of filth, whether it's like 
uh, well, pet waste on the floor or whether it's trash, rotting food. Yeah, those are the smells that they're talking about. All right, so level four. No, cl- uh, we're adding to this list. Uh, no clean dishes or utensils, mm. bugs, more than one blocked exit. Yeah, I, and so growing up, there was a time where we had a blocked exit, but it was just because where our house was situated. But you could argue that maybe there was, there there was, that was unnecessary. We had a blocked exit. Now mm. it it was an old door that you, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to use, and so like we put some stuff in front of it. But it was a blocked exit, so yeah. so you, that exit was obviously intended for use at one point. Otherwise, they wouldn't have built it there in the first place. Let's move on to level five, the most disturbing level. Okay, so it's all these things plus these last three things. Uh, at least four, at least four, too many pets. Well, at least four too many, not per, at least four pets per <laughs> local regulation. So what I what's so silly about this uh-huh. is that a you have to start with the local regulation. <laughs> which is going to be different. It's going to be like twenty or something, right? So there is the local, re- and then if you have not one or two or three over but four over so what ha- what if you have three too many pets and that just keeps you at a level four yeah order? yeah you're fine then. um noticeable human feces yes mm. and then the last one is rotting food. i forget to flush one time ryan you never <laughs> let it go <laughs> rotting food on surfaces and inside a non-working refrigerator that's hyper specific man mm. but uh we've all seen it Dude. Uh, Here's the thing, Ryan. You and I have been doing this for 10 years, and we've Mm -hmm. been exposed to a lot of different hoarders. Now, usually they're levels one, two, or three, um, and it doesn't go into the most extreme level four, level five with the human waste, pet waste, hoarding pets, et cetera. Mm. And so, but that doesn't mean that it isn't disorder. It is disorder. I'm not saying you have a disorder. I'm not diagnosing you with a disorder. What I'm saying is, if there is chaos in your life, then by definition, there is disorder. And so we're highlighting these five levels, not mm. to judge you, but to say, okay, if I'm feeling a particular way about my stuff, it's because there's disorder there. And the good news is if I truly understand it, it's not just about, all right, here, now to go download the minimalist rule book, there's 16 rules for living with less. Mm-hmm. No, 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 that's going to trap you. Mm. You first have to understand why, and then some of those rules, the decluttering, whatever, the how-tos may help you through it, but uh, understanding fundamentally what is going on here, Mm. the scarcity, the fear, the anxiety, we default to our default, right? And right now we're defaulting to the chimpanzee mind Mm. and, and where we... We need to accumulate. And yes, you can be a well-organized hoarder. You can be an affluent hoarder. There is a correlation between, an inverse correlation between hoarding and and income. Mm -hmm. However, you and I have both seen hoarders who make seven figures a year. They hoard differently, Mm. but it's still hoarding nonetheless. In fact, sometimes having more resources just allows you to hoard shinier objects yeah i mean they still junk it goes back to the folks that i was talking about who were very affluent and they had the shopping hoarding where they just yeah. bought 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 so yeah it shows up in different ways and um yeah rich or poor like people are affected by this for sure for the sake of time we'll take marie's question over on the private podcast mm-hmm. this thursday she's from san juan puerto rico and she wants to know how do i address the hoarding of a parent mm. when i'm still dependent on them and living with them. So yeah. Podcast Sean, remind me of that. Uh, but w- let's send her a, a copy of Everything That Remains because uh, it's the book that Ryan and I wrote, Everything That Remains, is really about a story about my mom's stuff is in there, but it's a story about going out on our own eventually when we can no longer be tethered there. Mm. We, we will answer Marie's question specifically on the Maximal episode over on Patreon this week, though. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Those texts go to both of us. And uh, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer every question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you like. And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place thanks to our good friend jessica lynn williams she's our social media savant 
She keeps, she stores, she hoards all of our minimal maxims. That's over right. At minimalmaxims.com. All right. SW wants to know how does one become a hoarder? Looking for tips. <laughs> <laughs> Step one <laughs> hoard. Uh, how might your life be better with a hoard? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, how does one become a hoarder? What starts the process? Is it nature? Is it nurture? So here's my pithy answer for you. Letting go is not something you do. It's something you stop doing. And so if that's, if that's true, mm. I mean, you stop clinging, mm-hmm. well, then you, hoarding is, means you start doing something. Mm. I know sometimes it's, we hear advice from you know, self-improvement gurus or, or whomever, and, and it's always about doing something. Uh, taking action. Of course, action is an important step, and, and, but when we take action first without an understanding, we often take actions that move us in the wrong direction. Mm. Letting go is not something you do. It's not an action. It is merely the, the, stop, the stopping of, of the clinging. How do we do that? Well, it's only through understanding, through immersion, through exposure to the benefits of living with less. And so mm-hmm. if the, op- the, the opposite of that then is not being exposed to the benefits of living with less. How did I become a hoarder mm-hmm. is the only question I can answer here. And it's because I didn't understand what enough was. Mm-hmm. How does one become a hoarder? When they think they are not enough. Mm-hmm. Tweet that podcast, Sean. So my pithy answer, it's, it's an oldie but a goodie. Clutter is the physical manifestation of what's going on inside us. So... Yeah, there's something much deeper going on. So how does one become a hoarder? What starts the process? I mean, these questions are simple questions, but there are very deep and difficult answers. And I think with each hoarder is going to be a different answer. Yeah. But I think the commonality is that there is something much deeper going on and that, that clutter is yes the physical manifestation of whatever that is that's going on in, inside someone it's yeah it's uh it, it's I, I wish you know there was there was something where you'd be like well here's what it is you had trauma in your life so now you're a hoarder mm. and like yeah, and, and maybe that's true but it's like it's so universal right that yes we have all had trauma sure undoubtedly even someone who grew up as idyllic as Bex, my mm-hmm. wife she grew up on a farm in Minnesota mm-hmm. with middle class parents. The dad's an attorney, a stay at home mom. Are her parents siblings, still married? Yes, yeah, still married. The, Man. A, and married parents privilege. <laughs> right. <laughs> but still, there's always, even in those scenarios, there may not be this deep seated trauma. You know, her first memory isn't of her father extinguishing a cigarette on her mother, like mine is. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the traumas still exist nonetheless. And she. Well, she may not be as predisposed to become a hoarder. She mm-hmm. certainly could. There are plenty of people who grew up in quote unquote normal or seemingly normal mm-hmm. circumstances who develop some sort of disorder and mm-hmm. up to and including and maybe even extending beyond a hoarding disorder. All right, yeah. before we get into our listener comments and our added value, by the way, Ryan, our added value this week, I brought three physical items. Since we're talking about hoarding. Minimalist. I have three physical items I want to run by you okay. for our added value save because the opposite of hoarding is not owning nothing. Right. You could tweet that podcast, Sean. The opposite of hoarding is not owning nothing. And so I own things that add value to my life. I want to talk about a few things that add value to my life, not necessarily prescribing them to you. So I'm going to talk about those on the added value segment today. I even brought a gift for you, Ryan. Oh. If you want it. And if not, throw it back in my face and spit on me. I hope it's a tie clip <laughs> so I can do that. <laughs> All right. We've got a bunch more surprise questions this week. Like, how do I get someone I love? to recognize that she is a hoarder. At what point would our digital collections be considered hoarding? So a mm. digital hoarder. Mm. That's one thing that we didn't talk about on this episode for sure, digital hoarding. What's the 10 step plan for addressing and overcoming hoarding? Mm. Actual question, we'll get into that. And although I think we can call it a bit of a plan, but we need to understand first. Plus, we have a horde of other questions. Oh, wow. About Good one. Ho- about hoarding and, <laughs> and about decluttering and much more. And if you want to hear all that, listen to this week's Maximal episode on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode. But each Thursday, Ryan and I record a much longer Maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast. We also do that whenever we have a guest. We have a mm-hmm. long-form Maximal conversation with them. Now, what I realized, Ryan, is that 
there are private things in my life that you and I don't talk about ever just because it's private, right? Yeah. Like if, um, well, I'm not going to give you an example, but there are private things. There are also public things. You and I just had a whole public conversation now about hoarding. Yeah. Happy to talk about those things publicly. Even some things that are difficult to talk about, I'm happy to talk about them publicly, like mm. childhood trauma. There are these. There's this middle space, though. Mm. I don't know if you would call it like semi-private or semi-public, or, or maybe it's both. Mm. But that's really the space of the minimalist private podcast. Mm. It's like this semi public space but not truly public it is a private podcast and, and so it uh, gives us the space that we need to sort of mess up to to talk about things that we wouldn't talk about in a traditional public sphere and, and sometimes in some ways it's like when a stand-up comedian goes on stage and practice in front of a small crowd instead of filming that and just putting it on youtube you you wouldn't do that the first time that you're you know just practicing some or the yeah. first time i write an essay or a book or something. I don't just hit publish. Mm. Like, no, there's there's a gestation period, right? And so sometimes there's first, second, third drafts over there, but it's a lot a lot more raw. It's the Minimalist Private Podcast. You can visit theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe and get your personal links so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our show and want to support The Minimalists, this is the only way our podcast earns any money. It's cheaper than a cup of coffee, and it keeps our show 100% advertisement-free. Plus, private podcast subscribers also gain access to hundreds, hundreds of hours of past private archives. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Check them out. Hi, this is Joe from Dallas. I was listening to some old podcasts, your collection one. I'm a disc golfer, and I used to have 500-plus discs of which I had probably thrown 50 of them more than one time. I had a big bag of putters, uh, 20 putters, I used to carry around to practice putting with. Uh, One day I bought a smaller bag so I could walk around with the putters and not have quite as much weight, only fit six putters in it. Uh, I had forgotten my larger bag and just had the smaller bag when I went out to play the next time. And I had to grab five discs to take on my round, and I shaved four strokes off of my best round ever. It was not a fluke. I continued to play with this smaller bag with only five, a couple of drivers, a couple of mid-ranges, a couple of putters, and I kept getting between two and five less than I had ever played before. Uh, I could only throw what I was really comfortable with because that's the only choice I had, and I became a much more skilled disc golfer by cutting down those options. Hi, guys. This is Stephanie from Harrison, Ohio. I'm calling in regard to your May 1st episode with Rich Roll about food. I had a comment and an added value. Um, My comment is that it was really nice to hear from somebody who is vegan um, about keeping things simple because I've transformed over the past few months um, through my vegan journey, and I've discovered the same thing, that just keeping things simple when it comes to food uh, makes things a whole lot easier. It's not as hard as what you might think in the beginning. But in my beginning phase of becoming vegan, I did find uh, a blog and um, a cook and baker who really adds a lot of value to my my recipes and what I chose to add to my daily intake of food. And her blog is The Minimalist Baker. Her idea is that she has the least amount of ingredients, the least amount of tools to make each recipe, and I have not had a bad recipe from her blog yet. You should check her out. All right, y'all, for our added value segment this week, we often talk about things that add value to our life, like experiences, like music or books. Mm -hmm. I I tend to think of those as experiences. Mm -hmm. You you can have a physical item. You can buy a cassette tape. Sure. I think. (laughs) Hipster. (laughs) (laughs) I just do it for the audio quality, man. (laughs) There's that audio hum in the background of a cassette tape. I just love. (laughs) But but since we're talking about hoarding today, we just did a whole episode on hoarding. I I don't want you to think that the opposite of hoarding is owning Nothing. It's not. The opposite of hoarding is being deliberate with the possessions that we do have. Mm. Consuming things deliberately. Things that add value to my life. Well, what does that mean? It means it increases my well-being in some way or it brings me tranquility, right? And so I have three objects here that I've gotten value from recently. All that said, 
these might be things that add value to the minimalists, mm. or at least at least half of the minimalists, but they may not add value to you. Mm. And so I'm not recommending you go buy these things. Mm. Now, at least one of these products uh, has offered to advertise on our podcast before. Mm. And because our podcast is 100% advertisement free, our YouTube channel is 100% advertisement free, no, adver- no pre-roll, nothing like that, I just said no. But... I do get immense value from this particular product. Well, so. there's a difference between talking about things organically, like you're getting ready to do, and then having the obligation to talk about something. So, um, yeah, we would never put ourselves under, under the obligation of having to promote a specific product. Right. That would not be genuine. And it wouldn't feel good, right? Right. And it, it wouldn't feel good because it wouldn't be genuine. You're right, right about that. So, All right, so what do you got? Where do I start here? Let me start with this element. Okay. Element is, uh, so quite often we hear about electrolytes, right? People. Yeah. People, you've had uh, Element before. This one. I've had Gatorade. A, this is <laughs> right with electrolytes. So we hear about electrolytes, and it's like, well, here, drink this terrible sugary drink that mm. is unhealthy for you because it's yeah. filled with sugar and maybe even food dye or whatever. I don't know what's in those, all the chemicals in those electrolyte drinks. Well, this is an electrolyte powder that I just put into water. Although there's different flavors, so the company here is called Element. And uh, again, not recommending it for you, but it's a way that I get my electrolytes every day. So sodium, potassium, magnesium in every single packet. So what do the electrolytes do for you? How do they help you out? Well, they keep you hydrated mostly. And and so that's the biggest thing. Okay. Right. And and so we are often, we drink just water without any minerals. And there are other ways to get these minerals as well. You know, if you drink Mountain Valley sparkling water, for example. Can I have this pack? Yeah, you can have this. Now, I'm I'm going to drink it during the break. Well, let me explain to you what what I do with this. So they have a bunch of different flavors. My favorites are the no flavor. It's just... It's just sodium, potassium, magnesium. It tastes like salt. It makes your water taste a little bit salty. Okay. So I I enjoy that just because it's super plain. And and there's something that's so satisfying, especially if you're really thirsty about Mm. that that salt taste. Hmm. It's not like drinking salt water. It's, it's, It's subtle. They also have some flavors that I put in cold water, like raspberry or orange. Or my wife's favorite is the uh, lime. And I keep some here at the office as well. So you all... Jordan No More podcast, Sean, are welcome to them as well. However, the chocolate flavor, it's a little bit harder to stir in with water because it has some cacao in it. Mm. So I put it in hot water Mm. and it makes this hot chocolate that, I mean, it's not delicious, sugary Starbucks hot chocolate, but it's the, it's just one pack. Nice. A healthy hot chocolate and I'm getting all my electrolytes for the day. Cool. So yes, you can have that. That is yours. So don't mix this with cold water though. Uh, I was you, literally going to pour it in this glass of water. You, you right can. Here. I wouldn't. I would wait until you have some hot water. Do a little bit of warm and water. I even okay. use one of those little whisk things to stir it up. Mm. But you don't have to. If you put it with hot water, it mixes really well. I stopped buying those whisk things because uh-huh. every one I've bought breaks. Like I've never. I, I, I have a pretty uh, nice one that I did That's a lot funny. of research on because Ella broke our last one. Bonus product. Yeah. No, I, I don't know what it is. So okay. I'm not going to tell you what that one is right. this one is a cbd oil mm. and so you know i have this terrible disease and i'm in uh, tremendous pain almost every single day yeah and the thing that has kept me from being in crippling pain throughout the the days this is uh i chris kelly actually is the one who first told me about this particular brand it's elixinol elixinol cbd yeah. now i use the i use their sports gel on my because i get really bad inflammation in my joints my mm. ankles especially mm. Especially if I eat any sort of fiber, it, my 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 ankles just really feel like they're broken. And so I, they have a um, sports gel that I put on my ankles. Again, not a sponsorship. Would never ever take any money from them. I pay for these just like you would if you want them. So what is it about that particular? Because I it's I know medical you, grade basically. Okay, because I know you've tried a lot of different CBD products. I have, and, and this one in particular. I mean, you you actually when we walked in here, you said I've never seen a bottle that has four thousand milligrams. I mean, it's of, a big bottle, but yeah, yeah, it's not that big. It's uh, but yeah, you're right it's four fluid ounces and, and and but it's so it's heavily concentrated although i'm not again definitely don't recommend this but one dropper has 32 or 33 um, hmm. so it's this teacher bottle here um, yeah. one dropper has i think 33 milligrams i have found uh-huh. that cbd and this is thanks to our friend uh ben greenfield yes i get i get deep i get more deep sleep mm-hmm. at night sometimes like i'll get which is crazy but i'll get more deep sleep than rem sleep when i do like 100 to 200 milligrams of uh, cbd yeah and so uh and 
High, that's a very high dose CBD, by Super the way. Super high. So, yeah. so one dose is 16 milligrams, right? Oh. So, so that's, oh, ha- it, that's half a dropper. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and, or maybe a third, you know, whatever. It's about half a dropper. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's one dose. But you're right. Because I have the extreme inflammation, I am often doing 150 to 200 a day. And I have great deep sleep as a result. Yeah. Um, I, well, I will say, now there's no THC in this, so it doesn't get you high. Right. But I do feel... Because I'm highly sensitive to these kinds of things, I feel a full sort of, it, it's almost Relaxed. like, I feel like a full body calm in a mm. way where things don't get to me as much. In fact, yeah, people lately, especially you have been like, you know, you seem calmer lately mm. or whatever. What's going on with you? You <laughs> seem so much nicer. <laughs> That's from our talk. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's, uh, the, this in particular has just, uh, has made me less stressed in a way it's made the things that really uh, bother me like our love people use things trailer recently had ad- so the, someone copyright claimed it and put ads on the front of it because we we paid to use their music but apparently the agreement who is a horrible company that we use jordan what's their name music bed yeah yeah we use this to buy you know, horrible you, company don't yeah. use them <laughs> this is the non-added value yes this is the um, uh, if you want to increase uh if you want less tranquility in your life use this company yeah <laughs> and, and so what what i realized with the with the music bed music that we used is they started placing ads we don't do ads on our youtube channel Mm. We're against ads. We have an anti-advertising stance. Advertisements suck. We'll never do ads. And yet someone else is putting ads on there for us. We, we're still trying to fix that. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, it will be corrected. Yeah. Well, typically, like, because we go out of our way to pay for the rights. Yes. So we don't have to do ads. Right. So, uh, yeah, the, the, what sucks about this company is we paid for the right to use that music. And ah. there, there's a clause that says... Yeah, well, we can still screw you over with that. Well, they can, but the artist who made it is now allowed yeah, to. And it's dude. like, well, but had I known that, I we wouldn't just would yeah. have not done it, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's like, well, yeah, okay, read the fine print yeah. or whatever. I get it. Like, yeah. yeah, but but if I have to read the fine print, you're not a, you're not a company I want to do business 100%. with. Hundred percent. So third, finally, here the third thing that has been adding value to my life. Remember, uh, three, four years ago, we were in Vancouver. Oh my God. Uh, I think it's around episode 100. Maybe it's episode oh 101. God. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Dude. We're in Vancouver. We have a uh, we have 50 city tour, the Less Is Now tour. We're giving a talk. We're we're walking around Vancouver, one of our favorite cities, just enjoying the city and, and the people. And it's me, you, and Podcast Sean, and uh, Social Jess. We're doing a sound check. Yeah. This venue. Solid venue. Enjoyed yeah. it. Except they left the back door propped open. They left it cracked a little bit. And someone broke into our dressing room, mm-hmm. stole my laptop bag with my passport and yep. everything else was in it, and stole Jessica's entire, everything she owned. You know, it's funny. She, we went back there because she had to grab something out of her bag. Mm-hmm. And she was, we were in the middle of sound check, so we were a little crunched for time. And she had this like, where's my bag? Where's my bag? Where's my bag? And I'm like, well, you know, did you put it here? There, We're looking for it. She's like, I'll just worry about it later. But there was something. I was like, this doesn't make sense. Mm. Like something is up. Uh, and yeah, long story short, um, we noticed your bag was missing. And then it hit us like, oh, wow, someone had come into the back. It's, and that's the only time they've ever had any issue with anything like that in mm-hmm. that in that venue. Um, yeah, they someone came in. They went into the green room because it was right there by the the back exit. Yep. They saw two bags. They grabbed them and walked out and went to the local park. Yes. Yeah. Now we got really lucky, and so here, yes. here here's what I what I recognize is we got lucky in the sense that if they would have just hopped on the train, which was right next to the park, yeah. they would have been gone. My passport would have been gone. I wouldn't have known how to get back into the country. Now, you know, I because of the minimalist journey we had been on up until that point i didn't experience misery i experienced discontent i mm-hmm. didn't have the same panic i would have seven years previous to that yeah but it's really about the passport yeah the passport thing is just like i mean and yeah i, I think the computer's replaceable everything's replaceable the problem is you can't get back into the united states without a passport right and there's but the thing is 
has it happened before? Has someone lost their passport? Sure. sure. So there has to be a process. I knew yes. that. And by the way, being stuck in Vancouver wouldn't be a bad thing anyway. Right. What a exactly. great city. Right. And so I, I wasn't I wasn't worried uh, about that. Yeah. But I saw the sheer terror on Jess's face because literally all of her possessions had been stolen. Her yeah. medications, uh, everything, or whatever. I don't know if it's medications, supplements, whatever, whatever. it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, a it, lot of her life was in that bag. Now, everything's replaceable. Yes. I mean, you know, if someone came to us and held us at gunpoint, mm-hmm. we would happily give them our things and right. everything would be replaceable. But, like, what you're alluding to is there was an inconvenience yes. factor. And there's a product I wish I would have had at the, had at the moment because it's just this tile tracker. And um, I saw the I saw the Kickstarter for this. So, does it... I've, so I did tracker before. Is it GPS? No, let me t- let me explain. Okay, sort of, but not really. Okay. Um. So I, and I got these for you as well, if you want them. Sweet. Um. So had I had a tracker in my bag, mm-hmm. I simply would have been able to locate the bag. Now there are two ways that you can do that. It's through Bluetooth. So if it's within I don't four hundred meters or something, then you are able to find. Uh, depending on the device, it's device specific. Okay. Um. But if for some reason it's out of sight of your Bluetooth, then it takes, um, it, it's the, the, what they call it, the logic of crowds, mm. or the wisdom of crowds. It, it's, this is sort of the knowledge of crowds, really, because um, what it does is it crowdsources everyone else's who, who has tracker. So for example, in my condo apartment in LA, mm-hmm. I turned on the app and it was like, there are 9,400 people nearby with, with trackers. So is some the, the, here's oh. how I found out about this. So I previously used something called Tracker, which is different from Tile. So the the brand I use now is is Tile, and previously I used Tracker, but it just didn't work very well. Mm. And so I started looking at the reviews and comparing them, reading articles, and I said, oh, like it wasn't that I that this technology doesn't work well. It's that that particular brand didn't work well for whatever reason. Uh, my batteries would die. The the it didn't connect with the app. The app was not very good. Yeah. So this connects with all the other tiles, basically. Um, no, no. Okay. It, it connects with other phones. Okay. So like hmm. if uh, and here's how I found out about Tile in particular. Our uh, acquaintance Matt Carney, who had a new song, an album, uh, announced recently. Mm-hmm. He the day his new song came out, Powerless, he <laughs> he had his car stolen. Oh my god. And he was on like, he was on Instagram <laughs> stories or live or whatever, and he was he was talking about hey, um, I, so I've tracked my tile. I, I had a tra- tile in my car, mm. and so he like he tracked it down using the the tracking method that this this uses. And he's like, I don't know what to do now. I'm supposed to confront this person. Do oh, I call the police? Yeah. And he called the police. They ended up settling it or whatever. Yeah. Long story short, I, I he. He, uh, the, co- the the tile he had was actually in a different stolen car, so someone stole another car and put his tile in there, so oh it's not God. foolproof. But um, w- what I've done is I in my computer bag, in my uh, luggage bag, my packed bag, I now have a tracker in the, or a tile in those. I had tracker, that wasn't working very well, but this has worked really well. Also, cool. my keys, my car, my wallet. There's this wall, so I got you this wallet version here, Ryan. Sweet. And this goes in your wallet if you want. If not, uh, I'm sure podcast Sean yeah, no, this or is cool, man. Jordan would like it. Um, no, I then, like this. You know, a piece of me wants to like put this on my bike if it's possible. Yeah, it is. In mm-hmm. fact, they have smaller ones called a, um, I think it's called a sticker. And mm. so you can buy you can buy different ones, and then here is like a for like uh, the bag or bag keychain wh- whatever. So yeah, and and then you just hook it up with the app. And here's the cool thing: if you ever lose your phone, you just you can double tap the uh, the that yeah that. Wait a minute. Um, yes. You can double tap that. And yeah. It will ring my phone even if the phone is on silent. Oh wow, that's cool. Yes, yeah, so you can set it up to do that. Pretty cool. So those are three things I get value from. Cool. You may not get value from them at all. I don't recommend them. In fact, you are already complete <laughs> without them. Oh, by the way, the electrolytes, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, the other thing they they do is if you're dehydrated, you, what symptoms do you get when you get dehydrated? You often get dry skin, yeah, dry, dry eyes, yeah. dry mouth. Yeah. And especially if you're taking a lot of CBD, yeah. you know, that, that you'll you'll start to feel dehydrated by that. So electrolytes you know, help with all the, the sort of dehydration symptoms like headache and, and things like that. Anytime I start to get a little bit of a headache, I'm like, oh, 
I might be dehydrated. Let me throw one of these packets into yeah. a, a glass of water. Well, I mean, I remember Dr. Ryan Green talking about when you wake up in the morning and how you're already dehydrated and uh-huh. then you go to drink something like coffee Yeah, and you're just f- dehydrating yourself more. Water's the same way if it doesn't have any minerals in it, right? Now this thing's making noises. Um, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting because, yeah, he, he recommended, like, he kind of had this homemade electrolyte drink that he was talking about with the pink Himalayan salt and some lemon juice. Yeah, that works That works really works well. Works also, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, no, this is great. I might add this to my morning routine because my what I do now is I have, uh, like, the filtered water through the Berkey, and yeah. I down, like, two mason jars full of that first thing in the morning before I drink anything else. That might be slightly dehydrating you, but the, the way that you crack that is just by putting a putting little bit of minerals in it. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. We just... Uh, we recorded this last year, Jordan. Let's talk about less. It's a video essay series. Uh, what we did is we went back and edited six of my essays from theminimalists.com and sort of did this this direct-to-camera video essay series. So it's it's called Let's Talk About Less, but each episode there's like, let's talk about minimalism. Let's talk about social media. Let's talk about technology. Let's talk about impulse shopping. Uh, I, see I really a smile on your face. I just really want to do a salt and pepper parody song of Let's talk about less, less baby. baby. Let's, Let's talk, talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things, something, something that we can rid ourselves of. I'm, oh, I, he dropped the ball. It's Jordan. not there yet. It's not there yet. Bleep that out. Blur, <laughs> blur his face. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about less. It's a new video essay series. You can find it uh, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash The Minimalist. Season one is going up right now, so there's a few episodes out there already. I think my favorite might be Let's Talk About Social Media, but I really like the way that Jordan filmed these, and he is, I mean, he's got so just, uh, I mean, he's obviously, he's using his talents in a way where he's, he's sharpening his skills, and it really shows in this series. Let's talk about less. Season one, I can't wait to shoot season two in the future. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Minimalists. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. And if you leave here today, oh wait, before you leave here today, if you want our show notes in your inbox, Sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. Don't worry, we won't unsubscribe you. We already did all that. <laughs> well, unless um, unless you want to be unsubscribed, you can unsubscribe at any time. We'll never send you spam junk or any of that other stuff. But uh, we will send you our simple Sunday emails as well as our podcast show notes. No advertisements, nothing like that. If you leave here today with one message, let it be this. Love people and hoard things. <laughs> Wait a minute. (laughs) No, use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.